Thank you for joining us here on this third day of Christmas at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Leading worship today is Grace Colloran, Kat Wilson, and Tom Wood. Our organist and music director is our beloved David Berry, and I am Reverend Susan Brazier. Let us join together as we worship God. Praise the one who spoke and made everything. Let the rivers ripple with joy. Let the mountains stomp their feet. Praise the one who adopts us all as children. Let the old folks tell their familiar stories. Let the little children dance with delight. Praise God. We will sing God's glory. We will shout the joy to the heavens. Let us worship God. Please pray with me. God of light and love, before we put away the ornaments and put the tree out by the curb, before we toss the cards and wrapping paper into the recycling bin, before we store the movies and music back into the closet, help us hang on to the meaning of this holy season. The peace, the hope, the joy, the love. Oh God, you are so patient with us. Will we find it hard to put up with the foolishness of others you became one of us and modeled a life of meekness and service to others. Will we strive for life about power and success? All creation sings your kindness. Will we hurl unkind words at those we say we most care about? Yet rather than becoming frustrated with us, you continue to forgive us. You clothe us with your love, we pray, so you might be more compassionate towards others. Touch us with your grace, so you might be more gentle people. Fill us with that peace with longs to resonate our hearts. Even as we seek to continue our journey with the child of Bethlehem, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please pray with me. Holy God, in the ancient words of the scriptures, let us hear afresh your eternal message of peace, salvation, and reconciliation. Send us your Spirit to open our minds and hearts to receive your truth through Christ, your Word made flesh. Amen. Today's readings from the New Revised Standard Version. The first is from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 10 to 62, verse 3. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. Hallelujah, praise to Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name. 
praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels praise proclaim. All his hosts together praise him. Sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye heaven of heavens, and ye thoughts above the sky. Let them praise the Jehovah for his sin, although he is high. And his hand is for his sword, and his hand is for his sword, and his hand is for his sword, far above the earth and sky. Let them praise us, give Jehovah. They were made at his command. Them forever he established. His decree shall ever stand. From the earth, oh, praise Jehovah. All ye floods, ye dragons all. Fire and hail, and snow, and flavors. Stormy winds that hear me call. Let them pray. For his name alone is high, and his hand is for his sword, and his hand is for his sword, and his hand is for his sword, far above the earth and sky. All ye fruitful trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high. Creeping things and beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all ye people, princes, great earth's judges all. Praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them praise his gift Jehovah, for his name alone. And his hand is for his exalted, and his hand is for his exalted, and his hand is for his exalted, far above the earth and sky. The New Testament readings from Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. On this third day of Christmas, our gospel lesson continues with the nativity story in Luke. And we are now to the part where it tells the story about Simeon and Anna. I find the stained glass windows here in St. Andrews to be really quite remarkable, but they tell a set of stories, and I find it very interesting that this story, the story of Anna and Simeon, would be the story that would be chosen to be told in this sacred space of St. Andrews. We have Anna, Simeon, who come and interact with the very young couple of Mary and Joseph. I want you to have the opportunity to see what is artwork in your space as we enter into this lesson today. Our Gospel reading this morning is from the second chapter of Luke, verses 22 through 39. Listen now for the Word of God. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be consecrated to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, 
a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts. When the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what had been said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Hanel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old, and she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was eighty-four. She had never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem, when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord. They returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. This is a word of God for the people of God. Please join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. The Nativity story in Luke spreads over the first two chapters of the Gospel. During Advent, we have been working our way through this narrative. Luke's account starts with an elderly couple of Zechariah and Elizabeth Zechariah is a minor priest working in the temple when an angel tells him that his quite elderly wife, Elizabeth, is going to have a child. Most storytellers would probably open this tale with a close-up of our protagonists, Mary and Joseph. They're young and energetic, kind of hip and cool. But no, Luke picks out a couple of codgers and they're standing around discussing their infertility problems. Some of us should probably feel a little better knowing that the tendency of discussing body parts that don't work so well as we age has a trait that's been around since before the birth of our Lord and Savior. I suspect talking about our aches and pains as we get older is simply a part of what it is to be human. I am fascinated by the next part of the story. Zachariah starts saying stupid stuff and God just shuts him up and shuts him down by rendering him temporarily unable to talk. Next, making an appearance, is Gabriel the angel who offers Mary the incredible opportunity, just believe, and she will invite not only God into her life, but into her very body. Accepting this opportunity, this fierce young woman treks through the 130 kilometers of the Judean wilderness just to make a surprise visit to Elizabeth, who we now know is her cousin. Under the care of Elizabeth and Zachariah, this older couple, Mary passes the first three months of her pregnancy. Mary then returns home to Galilee, making the same wilderness hike only to discover that because of some Roman imperial accounting system regulations, she now has to go back again to the region where Elizabeth and Zachariah live. This time, however, Mary has a company of her fiancé, Joseph, as they head to his hometown of Bethlehem. Mary has her baby. Angels slip a little advance notice to some shepherds who come to town to check out this new kid before heading back to work to the fields. Then, we arrive at this morning's scripture reading. 
Mary, Joseph, and the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, or as Luke refers to this infant king, Jesus, visit the temple for purification and to present Jesus to be designated as holy to the Lord. Only humans would be so presumptuous that they would have to designate God incarnate as holy before the Lord. I rather suspect that this made the late night comedy sketches in heaven. It is at the temple for this purification ritual that Mary and Joseph have an incredibly odd encounter with yet another elderly twosome, Simeon and Anna. We really don't know that much about Simeon, except that he really, really, really wants to meet the Messiah, and that he happened to be in Jerusalem when Mary and Joseph stopped by. We also know that he is righteous, and that he is in really tight with the Holy Spirit. Our text this morning tells us that the Holy Spirit has given Simeon inside information about the Messiah and then provides him with a pop-up reminder so that Simeon does not miss the event. We know just a bit more about Anna. She was married for seven years, probably had no children. You have to wonder why she did not choose to remarry after the death of her husband. Somehow I can imagine that she loved her husband so much that she simply could not imagine sharing her life with anyone else. Okay. Christmas is, if nothing else, a season for binge-watching romantic comedy movies. So just cut me some slack. At the very time of our story, Anna is 84 years old. It appears that she has taken up residence in the temple she was there night and day, praying and fasting. Many, many, many congregations are blessed by the guidance of older women who do a lot of the heavy lifting of the maintenance of the health and the life of the church. It is easy to imagine Anna in such a light. But there's one more thing that we know about this woman. We know her occupation. She is a prophet. Just like Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, Deborah, Miriam, our elderly Anna, at the age of 84, was still busy working as a prophet. In Anna, I see many women I greatly admire, women who sit in these pews, and women shaping our world, women like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Maya Angelou, the Queen, Claire LaRue Dubay, women whose wisdom and words create our culture, I think Anna was such a woman. Anna, after seeing the infant Jesus, before he even uttered a word, let alone preached the sermon on the plain, before he walked, let alone walked on water, our Anna already knew who and what he was. And she began to speak about him to all who were looking for redemption of Israel. You realize that makes Anna the very first evangelist. Not bad for being 84. During his holy encounter with the infant Jesus, Simeon provides two oracles. First, he proclaims that this teeny baby is a salvation not only of the people of Israel, but also that he is a light for the revelation to the Gentiles. Simeon's words reveal how intensely personal his encounter with Jesus is as well as what Jesus' birth means on a global stage. The second oracle is far more perplexing. Simeon takes Mary aside as he tells her that her child will be, how shall we say, um, a bit more challenging. It is Simeon's private conversation with Mary. We can already see that Jesus will turn the world upside down. Normally, we talk of something rising than falling. Not Simeon, no. In Jesus, things will fall and then rise. Jesus will be opposed. Jesus will reveal the innermost thoughts of many. And finally, being the mother of God will mean that Mary's soul will also be pierced. I have often wondered about this young couple, Joseph and Mary. They are clearly rule followers, 
They obey the imperial edicts at great personal cost when they travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem just to be counted in the census. They obey the Hebrew laws presenting their son in the temple with the required two turtle dove sacrifice. They would be the epitome, I think, of maritime loyalists. And placed within their care is this child who redefines and revives and gives new meaning to the laws. Jesus never goes along to get along. What a handful Jesus must have been for these parents to raise. Mary, your soul will be pierced. How many of us as parents of far more human offspring have had our children's actions pierce our souls? We hurt when our children hurt. We suffer as they struggle to find their way in the world. And all of this is a mere shadow of what Mary would endure guiding and nurturing Jesus to adulthood. So that brings us back to the end of this nativity cycle as told in Luke. If you are looking for the GPS star, the Magi, King Herod, or the slaughter of the innocents, you will find all those details in Matthew's Gospel. Here's what I find so intriguing about Luke's storytelling. This account opens and closes by focusing on the actions of works, the words of elderly people. Two men, two women of advanced years. These oldsters drive the narrative, provide protection and guidance for a young couple, and offer wisdom and blessing for the work that is in front of them. I don't think it is any accident that Luke chose to frame this beloved story in the Bible with old people. Our society would tell us that if you're old, you are no longer relevant and that you have nothing to offer. Our society would tell us that we would do better to take a seat and just get out of the way. Our society is simply wrong. For those of us who can rock the gray hair or get senior citizen discounts, our work has only just started. Our work is to encourage those who are just starting out to walk with them and to help them as they figure the rocky wilderness that we have already stumbled our way through. The work of our youth will be nothing that we have ever encountered, but we are so relevant and critically important to helping them fulfill their responsibilities. It is our job to do whatever is necessary to give those who follow behind us confidence in their abilities, to assure them that God will be with them just as God has been with us. As a prophet Joel wrote, God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Certainly our old man of Simeon with his relationship to the Holy Spirit dreamed dreams. And our young man, Joseph, saw visions. And the fierce young Mary in her Magnificat prophesied about the restoration of justice and the greatness of God. And her prophecy still rings through this narrative story and into our world. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the prayers of the people. God of love, as we celebrate the birth and life of Jesus, our Savior, we are filled with thanks. Our gratitude overflows in prayers for our world, the world you love. We pray for all children, guard their minds, protect their bodies, strengthen their characters, and give them joy. Help them to look to a future with hope and trust. We pray for the most aged among us, those whom Simeon and Anna bring to mind, 
protect them in the midst of the ongoing pandemic and reassure them that their value to you and to us, even when we cannot meet together. We pray for those whose hearts are filled with pain and fear. We pray for those for whom Christmas is linked with loss or grief. Surround each one with a strong sense of your comforting presence. We pray for those who do not have enough to eat and for those who lack adequate shelter in our community and in the desperate corners of the world. For those who eat alone without comfort of human contact and for those whose hearts and lives have been broken by trauma and loss and for those who struggle with the many costs of the pandemic. Surround each one with a strong sense of your comforting presence. We pray for family members and friends, those nearby and those who we could not meet with this year. Remind them of our steadfast love and to any who are struggling in this season, oh God, oh God, give your gift of peace. As the year draws to a close, we surrender to you, O oh God, the challenges it has held for us so that they will not remain as burdens. Remind us of the good things that have been offered to us, encouragement in times of isolation. We give you thanks for the people who continue to care for us and to care about us. Give us courage and wisdom for the year ahead. We pray for our leaders, and we pray that they will have wisdom and generosity of spirit for the decisions that they must make on our behalf. We pray for the support of those essential workers whose faithfulness to their responsibilities helps us cope in these difficult days. Grant us the hope, joy, and peace we find through trusting you as we pray together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to that which is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the Holy Spirit. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.